Greetings, physicists. This lecture will be about the uh, concept of torque and moment of inertia. So we've been talking about objects like a, a thin, rigid rod that we nail down at one end so that it has a pivot point and that it's going to rotate about that pivot point. So imagine the rod like it's on a table. We're looking down on it from above. It's nailed down to the table. It's stationary to start with, and to get it moving, we got to give it a push. We got to give it some kind of force. So we will apply a force on the edge of that rod. That force will cause an acceleration. Uh, but that acceleration will be sort of an angular acceleration. That force will lead to the object gaining angular speed or angular velocity. So we're going to have a, a similar situation to uh, the linear, uh, where if you had a, a force in a, on an object going in a straight line and it had mass and that force was unbalanced, you would get a linear acceleration. Same thing happens angularly. Well, we're going to define, so we had all these uh, linear to angular quantities, and I'll remind you of them. You had uh, position was equal to R theta. The angular version of position is um, angle. The angular version of velocity, we just call it angular velocity. The angular version of, oops, that's a velocity again. The angular version of acceleration was alpha. And we're going to have this, a similar relationship to torque uh, or to, to angular force. So a force that causes something to move will be called a torque. And we're going to use the symbol tau, which is a, a Greek T with a little curved tail at the bottom. And that will be used to denote an angular uh, force. Now, this is where it breaks from the pattern we saw before. For all of your angular quantities before, you had linear on the left equal to R times the angular quantity. For torque, it's the exact opposite. It's equal to the radius times the linear quantity. And it's not a dot product. Like, these are all dot products, which, if you're in calculus, that has a specific meaning. It's a cross product. It's R cross F. So that X is not a, a variable. It's a, a function. And what that means is, and I'll, I'll give you an example here. I'll, I'll redraw that hinge. Okay, here's the hint. Oh, that's not what I want. I want this one. We'll so redraw the hinge with the rod. I'm going to show you two forces. Here's a force straight up, like that. And then I'm going to show you this force on end. And I'm actually going to show you another force right here. So three forces. Now, I want you to imagine a door. Like we're looking straight down from above at a door. The hinges are right here on the left. The door is this wide. Maybe there's a handle over here or something. But we're looking down on it from the top. Consider those forces. We'll call them force A force B, and force C. And I want you to think in your mind, which of those forces goes the farthest towards opening the door? Which of it makes it easiest to open the door, assuming those forces all have the same magnitude? And if you're not sure, go find a door. You're probably near one. And try opening the door with each of those forces in those directions. Or it, uh, you may have to open the door a little bit to try force C because it's from the end. If you do it properly, you should notice the easiest one, the one that causes the most acceleration, is the force B. The next easiest one, although it's still pretty hard, is force A. Because when you push really close to that hinge, that door does not accelerate very quickly. And this force should not actually cause an acceleration at all. It should cause zero acceleration. Well, let's break this down. If you press with force C, you're essentially point pushing the door towards the hinge. You're, you're right in line with the pivot point. And any force that lines up with the pivot point of an object does not cause an angular acceleration. 
So that's not going to work. I mean, if you're if if you're leaning up against it and your arm tweaks to the side, you might accidentally wind up pushing the door open. But that's not that's because your force angle changed. If you keep that force directed at the hinge, you will not move that door at all. You will not angularly accelerate it. Now between these two forces, force B easier to open than force A. Or force you could, another way to say it is force B causes more of an angular acceleration than force A. And if we put like a third force in here, force D, if you will. Force D would be somewhere more, it would cause more acceleration than force A, but less acceleration than force B. And so what we find is that the, the distance you go from the pivot point makes a big difference. So what we'll say then is, what this cross product means is the radius matters. And like we said, we'll call this, this vector here the radius. That's how far away the force acts upon. But you also have to push perpendicular to that radius. Because if you push parallel to that radius, you will not cause any torque. So I'm going to come down here. Stop. No, really, stop. Oh my gosh. There. I'm going to come down here, redraw the same thing. Imagine I apply this force at this radius at this angle theta. I'm going to draw component vectors to that force. That force at this angle theta has two components. It has a component to the, to the right it has a vertical component. The component to the right is an adjacent, so that would be an F cosine theta. And the component that goes up would be an F sine theta. Now, this component that goes up is perpendicular to the radius. So it should cause a torque. But this component here that goes sideways is basically in line with the pivot. And so that component will not cause any torque. So only this perpendicular component can, can lead to a torque. So sometimes you will see the torque equation written like this. Torque equal to R F sine theta, where theta is measured from from a line that is that passes through the pivot and through the, the point of the force. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, you will also see this notation, R perpendicular to F, meaning that only the component of the force that is perpendicular to the radius will cause any torque at that point. All right? That's, that's the concept of torque. And, again, it doesn't look like any of the other uh, kinematic equations, right? V equals R omega, X equals R theta, alpha equals R... Nope, I did that one backwards. Linear A equals R times angular A, but it's backwards for torque. Torque puts the uh, angular quantity equal to R times the linear quantity. All right, well, we're going to keep going with this here. So we have that torque is RF, or R cross F, perpendicular to each other. And that would be, again, if I apply a force out here, what I'm really uh, doing to this rod is, is causing a torque, which is an angular acceleration, an alpha. Uh, but each point on the line will also undergo a linear acceleration, right, as, as denoted by this equation here, right? The, the linear acceleration of that point will be equal to r times the angular acceleration of that point. So what we're going to get into now is uh, the angular version of Newton's second law. So Newton's second law was f equal ma, or f over m equals a. So let's put some things in there. Uh, force, right? We have these two equations. I have the, the alpha, the A equals R alpha, so I'm going to actually just go ahead and sub that in. That's M 
times r alpha. And then the force here, if I solve for it, if I divide by r, I would get torque divided by r. So let's put that over here, torque divided by r. And if I multiply that r to the other sides, I'm going to get torque equal to m r squared alpha. This is kind of the angular version of Newton's second law. Now, in Newton's second law, we had that the force was proportional to the acceleration, and that proportion was uh, based on the mass. Well, here we have the angular force, or the torque, proportional to the angular acceleration by this factor, m r squared. And so this quantity turns out to be very important, and so we're going to give it its own uh, name. M r squared we will call the moment of inertia. And what you can think about it is, just like in a linear sense, if you push on something with more mass, it accelerates more slowly. If you push on, if you try to apply a torque to an angular, or to a, to a rigid body, to get it, give it an angular acceleration, if it has more moment of inertia, or a larger moment of inertia, it will accelerate angularly, or it will rotate. It will increase its angular speed more slowly. So that's what a moment of inertia is. And it's going to have its own letter. MR squared, we will represent with the letter capital I. And so that, and that's for a point. I, I need to make a, a, a statement there. That's for a single point on that line. Any single point has moment of inertia mr squared. And so our equation for a point particle that is trying to be uh, accelerated angularly with a torque, we would have the torque on that particle is equal to its moment of inertia times its angular acceleration. So this is, this is the angular equivalent of Newton's second law. Now there's one more thing we want to talk about with moment of inertia, and that is that you can have moments of inertia for large objects or for objects with volume. So for point particles, for a single point, if I just draw it, a single point that's going to like go around in a circle of radius r, right? there's the distance from the radius to the edge, its moment of inertia i equal to the mass of the point times the radius of the circle it's traveling in squared. There are bigger objects that we're going to try and accelerate. And I'm going to give you a couple of them. Now, there are, there are ways to calculate this and to figure out the moments of inertia for certain shapes, and you will definitely learn them in calculus. But for now, we're just going to give it to you for free. So let's take a rod, like that, a nice thin one, and I'm going to make an axis. That's my dotted line. And I'm going to rotate the rod in a circle, and that axis passes through a pivot point, so uh, like a helicopter blade. If we have a rod that wants to rotate about that axis, it will have an, a moment of inertia that's not quite equal to mr squared. It's equal to 1 12th of the mass of the rod. And then if the rod has length L, so the 1 half the mass of the rod times its length squared. That's, for, that's the moment of inertia because there's all kinds of points and we have to sort of add them all up, all the little pieces of mass of that rod and then take the average. And the average moment of inertia for this whole rod is 1 12th ml squared, assuming it has length L, okay? And there's going to be a few of these, so let me, let me give you a bunch. Let's say that you had that rod and it was like the rod we had before where here's the rod and it goes all the way out and it has length L. But we're not going to rotate it about its center like we did for the first shape. We're going to nail it down on this end and rotate it around that end. Okay, so if you rotate the rod about its end instead of about its center, it has a different moment of inertia. And that should kind of make sense, right? Uh, in this case up here where this dotted line was down the center, 
all of the points, the, ma the maximum distance they could be was half of its length away, whereas all the points here are, are like a full length away. So for this one, it has a bigger one. It's a third ml squared for that shape. All righty. Let's take, give you a few more here. Let's say that you have a, a flat plate. Kind of like this, okay? A little metal plate or something, or wooden plate. And we're going to make the line, the dotted line. I'm going to try and draw this, kind of go through it and come out this way. So this, this line is in, in right down through the center of the plane. And we're going to rotate it that way. All right, we're going to spin it around a line that goes through its center. But, but it's going through the thin edge. All right, that is a 1 12th of the mass of that plate times the area of the plate squared. Oh, I got that wrong. Sorry, this is, we're assuming this is a rectangular plate and it has length B on this side and length A on one of these edges and that's an A squared. So that's not an area, that's, a, that's the length of side A. And side A is perpendicular to the axis that it's spinning through. Okay, if we take the same slab, and so that looks a lot like the, the, for the rod. So if we take a plate like this, the same plate. No, I didn't want to change color. Same plate that and we move the axis over to here so that it's just kind of going along the right edge all the way down like that that's the axis we're going to rotate it about again like that and it's length a and length b this is one third m a squared so Basically, what I'm telling you, if I go, this is one third and one twelfth, this is one third and one twelfth, right? Here, the rod was rotating about this axis, and then this rod was rotating essentially about that axis, the middle and the side. Here, below, that's the middle and the side. So it does not matter, essentially, how thick that rod is. If you stretch that rod all the way out into a, a plate, you get the same moment of inertia. All that matters was the, the sideways length. Okay, good to know. Uh, let's do some uh, cylinders, because these come up quite a bit. So we'll say uh, a spinning cylinder, a grad, uh, like that. Let's see if I can draw me a, yeah. Picture that's a cylinder. Picture that I can actually draw. And the the rod is, or the thing is going to go through here and come out the back. So we're spinning like a uh, a rod or a, an axis through its exact center of the cylinder. And we're going to claim that the radius here is radius r from here to here, from the center where the axis is out to the edge of the cylinder. And it has mass m. This spinning object has a moment of inertia of 1 half times its mass times its r squared. Now let's take a hoop. So the cylinder was solid. The hoop is not. The hoop is like a, like a hula hoop. And let's assume that it has a tiny, tiny, tiny thickness. So we'll, we'll assume that this, this thickness is negligible. All right? And it goes back like there. And there's another hoop in the back over here. All the way back, like that. OK. So it's a very thin hoop all the way back. And again, the rod goes through the center. It comes out the back. And it has a radius to the center of radius r. This one has just an m r squared. That is his moment of inertia. 
So that's actually uh, the same as the point particle. All right, keeping on. Let's say you have a, a perfect sphere. So I'll try to draw me a sphere here. There's my sphere. <laughs> a solid sphere. It's, it's like, a, like a marble or a, a billiard ball or something. And the axis we're going to rotate it through goes through its center, comes out the back. So, and let's say the sphere has a radius of r into the center. Um, the moment of inertia of a solid sphere rotating about its center is 2 fifths m r squared. And then what if you had, instead of a solid sphere, a hollow sphere? Now this is almost impossible to draw. But since I have such great drawing skills, I will, I will pretend that I'm drawing it anyway. So here's your, your, your hollow sphere, and I'll just put a little dashed line around the edge to indicate that it's a shell. Think of a ping pong ball, right? A ping pong ball or a tennis ball. Those have air inside. They don't, they're not solid all the way through. Okay, and the axis, again, goes through the center and comes out the front. And it has radius r. Come on, r's. You can draw me an r. Okay, a solid sphere has a two-thirds mr squared moment of inertia. And that's pretty much, those are the most basic shapes that you're going to encounter. There are other shapes out there, but I think those will, will do for you. So if you ever encountered a sphere, a solid sphere like this one here, and they said there's a torque on it of, of five newton meters or something, well, you have a, a torque equal to I alpha, and the torque you could plug in because they gave it to you, and the I, you could just plug this in, two-fifths of the mass of the sphere times the radius of the sphere squared. So you're using the I for the specific shape that you, that you need, and that's where those become useful. All right, I hope this, was, this will help you in uh, solve. Well, this wasn't about solving, but this is the lecture on torque and moment of inertia.